Hello and welcome. This webinar forms part of a series of webinars given by Mayor Brown's Global Employment and Benefits Group on the issues affecting employers who are planning a return to work or who are adjusting to carry on business in the current circumstances. It forms a part of Mayor Brown's 10 Hundred series, providing guidance into the top 10 pivotal issues across various topics that businesses need to be mindful of in the first 100 days of returning to work. Mayor Brown's global COVID-19 response offers insight on and analysis of the virus's impact on business worldwide through the dedicated portal known as Responding to COVID-19, which can be accessed via the Mayor Brown website or by searching covid19.mayorbrown.com. We have designed the webinars so that they can function equally well as either an audio-only broadcast or accessed via a video link. We hope you enjoy the series. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our webinar COVID-19 Back to Business and Perspective on Germany. I'm Guido Seppenfeld and I'm a partner in the employment law team of Mayor Brown. Today I will be joined by my colleagues Svenja Fries, Pauline Moritz, Vanessa Klesi and Hagen Köckeritz. And together we will provide you with an overview of the key employment law topics that employers in Germany will need to be aware of in connection with their way back to partial or complete post-lockdown resumption of business in a COVID-19 environment. We held a webinar for multinational employers back in May, which discussed the employment benefits and mobility issues and risks at, globe, at a global level, in particular highlighting Europe, the UK, the US, Brazil and Hong Kong. You can access this global webinar via the Mayor Brown COVID-19 portal called Responding to COVID-19, which is available through the Mayor Brown website. In today's webinar, we will take a deep dive into these issues specifically from a German law perspective. This webinar is part of our, one, of our 10 hundred series, focusing on the top 10 issues that employers need to consider in the next 100 days. You can access the other webinars of this series via the Mayor Brown website over the coming weeks covering the legal situation in Brazil, France, Hong Kong, the UK and the US. The 10 hundred issues that we will discuss today for employers in Germany in connection with their return to a new normal are the following. Managing terminating short-term work, maintaining terminating work from home arrangements, Liability risks in connection with workplace health and safety. Enforcement risks in connection with workplace health and safety. Formal risk assessments. Risk minimization in connection with workplace health and safety. Employee data privacy issues. Headcount planning and development. Works council consultation. And employee mobility. Thank you, Guido. Of course, uh, short-term work uh, plays a dominant role in many companies these days. Actually, one out of three companies has implemented short-term work in response to the COVID-19 crisis. As we've all heard on the news, in May, approximately 7.5 million people in Germany were on short-term work. The number of employees who initially had been expected to be on short-term work was even higher, more than 10 million. In, compar in comparison to what we saw back in 2008-2009, with a peak number of 1.5 million employees in short-term work, we all realize the current situation is fairly dramatic. Most companies started to implement short-term work in April and May this year by negotiating and concluding necessary works agreements or individual agreements with their employees. Now they are faced with numerous questions relating to the day-to-day -day handling of short-term work. So, what are the most common questions clients are asking? Many questions circle around vacation and any interdependencies with short-term work. Employees can take vacation during short-term work periods, and they should actually be encouraged to do so. Otherwise, the bulk of vacation will have to be granted after the end of the short-term work, which means a high absence rate that can cause operational issues. Vacation should not only be taken on work days. Otherwise, there is a certain risk that the employment agency considers short-term work between vacation days to be avoidable. Whenever employees want to take longer stretches of vacation, there should be no short-term work days in between. Other questions are related to sickness. Depending on when the sickness started, meaning prior to or during short-term work, employees are either entitled to sickness benefits from their health insurance 
or to a continuation of short-term work allowance for any hours lost as a result of the short-term work. For regular working hours that an employee cannot work due to sickness, the employer owes the regular continuation of pay and benefits. What other issues are clients asking about? Top-up payments, for instance. As you know, <clears throat> many companies offer top-up payments in addition to the short-term work allowance in order to mitigate the financial impact that short-term work has on employees. Until recently, such top-up payments were fully taxable compensation. This has been temporarily changed by the legislator. Top-up payments for the period March 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020 are tax-free, provided that together with the short-term work allowance, they do not exceed 80% of the remuneration lost due to the reduction of working hours. Up to the same 80% level, top-up payments are also exempt from Social Security contributions. Companies also grapple with the handling of working time accounts. There are certain types of working time accounts that are fully or partially protected and can remain untouched during short-term work. Others have to be used first before short-term work allowance can be applied for. As a general rule, overtime work by employees affected by short-term work should be strictly avoided. It is even more important that the hours reported to the employment agency in the application for short-term work allowance are in line with the hours actually worked. Otherwise, if less hours are reported than actually worked, this can constitute a criminal offense and have significant consequences for companies and their representatives. There are also time recording requirements that many companies are unaware of. For every calendar month with short-term work, companies must be able to prove to the employment agency for each day the actual number of hours worked and numbers of hours not worked due to the short-term work, sickness, vacation, public holidays, or any other reason. While short-term work allowance is typically paid quickly based on a summary examination of the information submitted by the employer, the decision remains open for later review by the employment agency. Employers that do not have a proper working time documentation run the risk of having to repay short-term work allowance. Interesting. What about companies that do not suffer as much as expected? Can they terminate short-term work at any time? That depends on the underlying agreement. In many cases, employers have entered into framework agreements and determined the amount of the working time reduction on a monthly basis only, so they can return to full-time fairly quickly. In other cases, the amount of short-term work has been fixed for a longer period of time already, such as until the end of the year. However, most agreements that we know allow the employer to end short-term work at their discretion without approval from the Works Council. The Federal Labor Court has expressly ruled that the decision to end short-term work prematurely is not subject to Works Council code determination, so employers should generally be flexible. It may be worth mentioning that even with a premature termination of short-term work, existing framework agreements will potentially continue to apply and may, for instance, exclude business-related terminations. And with that, I hand over to Pauline, who is going to talk about working from home arrangements. Thank you, Hagen. We know that many employees have been sent to the home office during the peak of the pandemic to avoid further infections. But I want to start with uh, clearing up one common misconception. There is no general right to work from home. The employee's fear of a possible infection at work does not change this. Vice versa, the employer cannot require the employee to work in the home office instead of the company office. The employer, the employee must be provided with a workplace in the comp company office unless the home office has been agreed in the employment agreement. Working from home, therefore, generally requires the mutual consent of employer and employee. If the home office shall now remain the regular place of work even after the lockdown period, a contractual agreement should be concluded, setting out the rights and obligations of the employer and employee with regard to the home office. If a works council exists in the company, framework regulations should be laid down in a works council agreement. Such agreement, whether as a supplementary agreement to the employment agreement or as a works council agreement, should bindingly regulate important points such as working hours in the home office, access and control rights of the employer, data protection or regulations on cost reimbursement. 
So who pays for the workplace equipment? And I'm not thinking of a laptop, but rather other things such as furniture, internet, and power supplies. Generally, the employer bears the cost for all home office equipment and supplies, such as internet and power supply, unless this is other, agreed otherwise in the home office agreement for practical reasons, for example. In practice, oftentimes, the employee uses its own private flat rate internet and therefore does not demand a cost reimbursement from his employer. If the employer has unilaterally ordered the employee to work from home during the lockdown, such arrangements can now be termed unilaterally by the employer at its own reasonable discretion. A home office agreement can also provide for other means of termination, such as revocation options or a time limit for the home office. And what else do I need to be aware of as an employer? If you want to have your employees working from home even after the lockdown, you need to be aware of ocup ocup that occupational health and safety standards do not end at the employee's front door. All safety regulations also apply at the Home Office, in particular the Occupational Safety Act and the Working Hours Act. For example, rest and break times must be adhered to in the same way as in the company office. A constant mixing, mixing with leisure time must be avoided. The employer is also obliged to carry out a workplace risk assessment according to the Occupational Safety Act, even if the work, even in the workplace is in the employee's house. The employer remains responsible for the safety of the workplace and equipment provided. The risk assessment can only be carried out in the employee's home office. For this reason, the employ, employer should be granted the required access and control rights in the underlying home office agreement. Another important point is data protection. Data protection must also be ensured in the home office. In particular, family members must not have access to professional data. It is therefore important to use appropriate encryption measures. Furthermore, employees should be given clear instructions on how to use the equipment provided and how to set up the home office. For example, it should generally be obligatory that the room in which the home office is set up is properly locked when the employee leaves. Here, again, a home office agreement is essential to limit the risks involved. With regard to the employee op occupational accident insurance, it is important that there is a clear separation between pro the professional and the private sphere in the home. This means a clear allocation of which part of the house is to be used as a workplace and at what times the employee is to, is to pursue his professional activities. It may also be advisable to arrange for a private accident insurance in, in individual cases. So I'm now handing over to Guido who will inform us about further issues regarding to workplace health and safety after the lockdown. Thanks, Paulina. When moving back to business or to any kind of a new normal in the COVID-19 environment, employers need to be aware of various pitfalls. From a workplace health and safety perspective, diligence standards and liability risks are significantly higher than in normal times. This applies both to the employer's organization and to its management personnel. In essence, that's the consequence of the interplay between German public law, health and safety regulations, and the fiduciary duties of an employer vis-a-vis -vis its employees. Pursuant to Section 618 of the German Civil Code, each individual employee can claim from his or her employer that the workplace is organized and arranged in such a way that excludes health and safety risks as much as possible. This claim is predicated on the mandatory public law, health and safety regulations, in particular enshrined in the German Workplace Protection Act various ordinances, as well as the corona-specific regulations issued by the German states, for example, on the basis of the German Infection Protection Act. In practice, employers are facing the challenge to comply with statutory diligence requirements, staying abreast of a dynamic and complex regulatory environment, and we will take a deeper dive on how to cope with this situation in the further course of today's webinar. 
Pursuant to the general rule of Section 3 of the German Workplace Protection Act, the employer is obliged to implement the necessary workplace health and safety measures, taking into account all circumstances that could have an impact on employees' health and safety at the workplace. In doing so, employer need to factor in a couple of general principles. In particular, the employer needs to consider state-of-the-art technology, workplace medicine and hygiene standards, as well as recent findings of workplace signs in order to exclude or minimize inherent workplace risks. Going back to business in the light of the prevalent COVID-19 risks, the employer needs to take into account a myriad of frequently updated workplace science findings and epidemiological recommendations. Furthermore, there are mandatory ordinances on a regional level, such as minimum distance rules or social contact restrictions. The employer needs to keep an eye on all of these rules, regulations, and recommendations in order to comply with its workplace health and safety obligations. We will talk through this later on in this webinar. In addition, Works Council consultation requirements need to be considered by the employer in Germany, which we will also discuss later on. In case of a failure to comply with all this, employers in Germany will in particular be facing the following risks. Firstly, the employer runs the risk of payment obligations without receiving the employee's services. Employees are entitled to claim that the employer implements mandatory specific risk mitigating measures at the workplace, for instance, regarding minimum distance rules. In the absence of specifically prescribed measures, the employees can claim that the employer exercises its sensible discretion regarding the implementation of necessary and appropriate protective measures, which the employer needs to get on track and done in a timely fashion, as the case may be even with proper involvement of the Works Council. If the employer fails to do so, employees have the right to refuse to work without losing their entitlement to pay. Secondly, employers may face significant financial risks should an employee in fact contract COVID-19 at the workplace or even dies of that. In that case, the employer may be exposed to damage claims brought by the employee or his and her relatives. In principle, employer's liability for personal damages suffered at the workplace is restricted to willful intent according to the German statutory workman's compensation insurance law. However, the current position taken by the German statutory insurance organization is creating a lot of uncertainty here. The relevant insurance bodies take the view that the workman's compensation insurance will not be liable for COVID-19 infections at the workplace because of the pandemic character of the virus. If this view is upheld, employers will not enjoy the liability privilege under regular German law. Instead, the employer will also be liable in case its mere negligence has caused infections at the workplace. In such a case, the employee or his or her relative would simply have to substantiate and prove that objectively, not all prescribed or recommended health and safety standards have been implemented at the workplace. To rebut such a claim, the employer will be required to prove that its acts or omissions have not been the cause for the infection. So in fact, in a courtroom scenario, the employer's defense arguments would be quite difficult to establish. In practice, it will be key for the employer, employer to be able to prove that it has fully complied with the diligence requirements and fiduciary duties in respect of workplace health and safety. This will be the only way to effectively limit its liability risks. risks. Again, we will discuss this in more detail later on. Third, to the extent ordinances on the basis of the Workplace Protection Act are violated by the employer, administrative penalties may be levied. Violations of ordinances on social contract restrictions on the basis of the German Infection Protection Act, for instance, can be held as both administrative and criminal offenses. Should management personnel be accountable for such violations or in case of failure of the management to properly supervise the employer's organizations, fines can be up to 10 million euros. Lastly, in a worst case scenario, even criminal liability of the employer or its management personnel for bodily harm because of negligence or involuntary manslaughter can be in question. All in all, there are significant liability risks for the employer in connection with moving back to business in times of corona. In order to manage these risks, employers need to get used to enhanced workplace health and safety 
diligence standards. And with that, I turn it over to Hagen to talk about enforcement risks. Thanks, Guido. Employers are exposed to enforcement action not only by employees or works council, but also by authorities. In Germany, compliance with health and safety at work laws is monitored by governmental bodies at different levels. State agencies for health and safety at work, trade supervisory boards, and in many cases, district governments or municipalities have to ensure compliance with the statutory health and safety at work law. At the same time, employers, liability insurance associations monitor compliance with the accident prevention rules, guidance, and individual orders passed autonomously by the statutory accident insurance. Given the special situation and the risk that a potential coronavirus infection spreads outside the workplace, the authorities work closely together with local health offices. And what rights do these authorities have? Can they, for example, inspect the work workplace unannounced? All of these authorities have far-reaching information rights and rights to access and inspect business premises. They can review documentation, initiate the preparation of expert opinions, perform tests, and take samples. If orders are not followed, the authorities can demand a suspension of working activities or even shut down business premises. Ultimately, if companies fail to take appropriate health and safety at work measures, this can trigger administrative fines of up to 5,000 euros. If a company fails to comply with an individual order by an authority, fines can go up to 25,000 euros per case. In serious cases such as ongoing and perseverant non-compliance, employers or responsible individuals may even be subject to imprisonment of up to one year or a corresponding monetary fine. So in practice, how likely is it that my business will be subject to inspection? At this point, authorities do not have sufficient capacity to perform a large number of site visits. In addition, site visits could further increase infection risks, which is why authorities are rather hesitant to go out and perform controls on site. They take a more reactive approach and address complaints from individual employees, works councils, or unions. Looking at statistical figures, it is rather unlikely that companies will be subject to inspection. In the last 10 years, the number of regular site inspections fell from 332,000 in 2008 to only 167,000 site inspections in 2018. On average, across Germany, business premises are visited every 25 years with regional differences. So in some states, um, it's the, the average 5.5 um, years and others even up to 50 years. There are also differences based on industry. Interestingly, in the data processing and telecommunications sector, for instance, we see site visit intervals of up to 75 years. However, companies should not rely on these statistical figures and hope that they will remain under the radar. Most companies are under critical supervision by the employees and works councils. Employees, in particular those with special needs or limitations, are strongly focused on their individual health situation and could potentially seek help from supervisory authorities. Once a company is reported to the authorities or experiences one or more cases of COVID-19, it immediately becomes very likely that health and safety at work measures will be reviewed. Therefore, we strongly advise to identify and take action at an early stage and before the authorities knock on the door. And with that, I hand over to Guido, who is going to talk about the obligation to perform risk assessments. Thanks, Hagen. In my previous slot, I already briefly explained the obligation of employers under German public workplace health and safety law to implement all measures necessary to protect employees against any workplace-related risks for their health or their lives, or at least to minimize any of these risks. Well, this obligation is rather abstract. It needs to be substantiated for being put into practice. It is for this reason that the employer is statutorily obligated to formally assess the inherent health and safety risks for its employees and to determine the necessary workplace protection measures on the basis of such risk assessment. The key provision for such formal risk assessment is Section 5 of the German Workplace Protection Act. In parallel, there are a range of more specific risk assessment regulations enshrined in ordinances for workplaces with specific profiles 
such as the workplace ordinance, the operational security ordinance, or the ordinance in biological agents. In practice, it will be key for employers in Germany to adapt the statutorily prescribed risk assessment to the specific risks in connection with moving back to business in a COVID-19 environment. The Workplace Protection Act generally states that one of the relevant causes for workplace risks can be the impact of biological substances. It is not required that the risk of contracting COVID-19 is directly related to the kind of work done, for instance, at workplaces in the clinical sectors or in laboratories. Rather, also the specific corona infection risk, risks at other workplaces, such as in traditional manufacturing sites or in office premises, will need to be evaluated as part of a formal risk assessment, and the respective protective measures will need to be implemented. Adapted checklists for formal risk assessments, specifically with regard to a pandemic environment, are available. These checklists are amended so as to reflect the current recommendations of the workplace health and safety authorities. Amended checklist items are, for instance, operational pandemic plans and hygiene concepts, supply of face masks or other personal protection equipment, appointment of specific corona coordinators at the business operation, checks of air condition systems regarding their virus dissemination potential, and so on. Employers in Germany are obliged to document the results of the risk assessment, the respective health and safety measures determined on that basis, and the results of the ongoing evaluation and stress testing of these measures. Employers are also required to instruct employees in respect of the risk assessment and the measures taken. With a view to the significant liability risk, which I had already addressed previously, employers are well advised to comply with these requirements with utmost diligence. In practice, the timely conduct and implementation of the formal risk assessment and the respective health and safety measures can be a problem. As a general concept, the formal risk assessment is a matter of going concern. However, some workplace health and safety ordinances require that the risk assessment is done and documented prior to the actual resumption of the work activity. This may become an issue because of the fact that the conduct of the formal risk assessment is subject to mandatory works council consultation and co-determination. In other words, a legally relevant risk assessment as a proper basis for appropriate health and safety measures requires prior consent of the employer and its work ca works council on the methodology and the instruments of the risk assessment, the work activities and workplaces to be evaluated, and the selection and determination of the necessary health and safety measures. To wrap up, Employers planning and preparing for a partial or full resumption of their business activity need to consider the risk assessment topic already at an early stage. If they fail to do so, they run the risk of lacking the actual basis for creating a workplace in compliance with German health and safety standards. And now over to Hagen to talk about the important topic of risk minimization. All right, so what is it that companies should do to minimize their inherent risks? The employer has the responsibility to implement necessary infection control measures in accordance with the results of the risk assessment. The implementation of such additional infection control measures should be coordinated by the Occupational Health and Safety Committee or, absent such a committee, a special coordinating or crisis unit established under the direction of the employer. The measures are best described in an occupational pandemic plan, which needs to be communicated to the employees so that compliance can be monitored. Pandemic plans should address the specific situation at the workplace and describe the organizational, technical, and personal measures to be taken in order to minimize the infection risk. And what are the standards to be observed? Is there any reliable guidance that employers can use? There is very helpful and comprehensive guidance out there from a number of authorities. On April 16, 2020, for instance, Germany's Federal Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, Hubertus Heil, together with the Managing Director of the German Statutory Accident Insurance, uh, Dr. Stefan Hussein, presented a uniform SARS-CoV-2 occupational safety and health standard. This standard formulates concrete recommendations for technical 
organizational and personal safety and health measures to be adopted during the coronavirus crisis. Technical measures can, for instance, include the placement of optical and physical barriers in the workplace to ensure a minimum safety distance of 1.5 meters, the regular cleaning and disinfecting of facilities and devices, the provision of necessary hygiene and sanitary products, and improvements to ventilation systems. Organizational measures can include, for instance, the implementation of a pandemic plan, modified access rules, shift working systems, staggered break systems, the assignment of tools, and individualized personal protective equipment, PPE. Finally, personal measures may include the requirement to wear mouth and nose coverings and PPE, instructing and um, active communication, special measures for the protection of high-risk groups. The German Statutory Accident Insurance has published additional guidance on various topics, such as 10 tips on occupational pandemic planning, the use of PPE, how to properly disinfect and clean surfaces in the workplace, recommendations on the management of employees who have been tested positive for the coronavirus or who are suspected to have the infection, and finally, guidance relating to the special situation of pregnant employees. The German Statutory Accident Insurance also provides leaflets and posters that can be published in the workplace to make employees aware of the basic do's and don'ts. There is also a broad offering of specific guidance for particular sectors and professions. Employers can find further helpful information on the websites of the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the Federal Ministry of Health, the Federal Center for Health Education, and certainly the Robert Koch Institute, which is the leading governmental institution in the field of biomedicine and plays a major role in the prevention and combating of infectious diseases. Most of the basic guidance and rules apply Germany-wide and irrespective of a specific sector or industry. However, employers also need to pay special attention to the various ordinances at state level that define rules of conduct for specific businesses such as restaurants, hotels, or recreational establishments. Such state ordinances do not only protect the general public, but also employees working in such specific professions. So does that mean that employers are on the safe side if they follow some of the recommendations that have been published? No. While the guidance is made available by the various authorities, uh, absolutely helpful for companies, it also defines the minimum standard of what is recommended and technically feasible. If employers fail to meet the relevant standard of diligence and care, and employees get sick or even die due to substandard safety and health measures in the workplace, this will significantly increase the risk of liability. Therefore, employers need to stay abreast of any developments and improvements of the technical standards and legal requirements and need to regularly review and adapt their health and safety measures. And now over to Svenja, who is going to talk about employee data privacy. Thank you, everyone. Of course, minimizing the health and safety risks at the workplace would ideally require maximum transparency of the physical or medical condition of each individual employee entering the work premises. However, even in times of these, such transparency is restricted by privacy rules and regulations. A few basic principles up front. In general, processing personal data requires a purpose and a justification. This can, for instance, be the employer's duty of care that we already talked about. Also, employers must not collect any data that is not necessary for their respective processing purposes. This principle applies to the amount of personal data that can be collected, the extent of the processing, the period of storage, and the transfer of and access to the personal data. And finally, there are certain kinds of personal data that enjoy a special level of legal protection. These are the so-called special categories of personal data or sensitive data. Health data falls in this category, which is relevant to remember when considering measures in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Let us now dive into the practical implications. What steps can employers take in order to protect their employees without violating privacy rights? Can I ask my employees to let me know if they have been tested as positive, if they have symptoms, or if they, if they suspect that they might be infected? Yes, 
Most of the German data protection authorities even see an obligation to inform the employer without being asked to do so. Employers can also ask whether employees have had contact to confirmed cases within the last fortnight or whether they have spent time in areas considered high risk by the competent authorities. Asking about the exact location is, however, not necessary and therefore not permitted. Can I ask for my employees' private telephone numbers or email addresses in order to inform them about a suspected or confirmed case or about a closure of the business premises? Even in the current situation, employees are generally not obliged to give their private telephone number or email address to their employer. However, it can often be in the interest of the employees to be informed at short notice about restrictions on the following day. Therefore, employers can collect and use private telephone numbers or email addresses for specific and transparent purposes on a voluntary basis and with the employee's consent. Any such private contact information may, however, only be stored for the duration of the pandemic situation and must be deleted immediately afterwards. Can I inform my employees that one of their colleagues has tested as positive and tell them who it is? In most cases, no. It is understandable that an employer will want to warn the persons this employee has been in contact with and also ask them to get tested. However, this will often be possible without disclosing the identity of the infected employee. Typically, it is sufficient to inform the workforce that a member of a certain department has been infected. Additional details regarding the days the person was present or the communal areas he or she frequented can be given where necessary. The employee can also be asked to provide a list of his or her recent contacts who can then be approached directly. Can the, employee take the, temper the employer take the temperature of its employees before they enter the business premises? Here, the opinions of the German data protection authorities diverge. More lenient authorities consider the circumstances of the respective business. They allow temperature tests if, they, if there have been confirmed cases at the site in question, if the site is based in a risk area, or if the working environment requires close body contact. However, any data obtained thereby must not be saved or at least deleted immediately. Other authorities explicitly deny, leg the, deny the legitimacy of temperature testing. They point out that high temperature does not necessarily permit the conclusion that the respective employee has been infected with COVID-19 and that a normal body temperature does not exclude an infection. With this background in mind, we would advise that employers be cautious with respect to compulsory temperature testing and use other ways to ensure the health and safety of their employees. Okay, but if I ask my employees if they, and they agree, surely this would be possible? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Due to the dependent nature of the employment relationship, it is generally doubtful whether an employee's consent can be given voluntarily and freely. Therefore, there is no guarantee that a data protection authority would accept consent as a justification. Hmm. Having heard all of this, I understand that there is very little I can do without risking a breach of data privacy rules. Does that mean I should just do nothing and endanger my employees? Of course not. As mentioned before, employers have a duty of care vis-a-vis -vis their employees. There are several points you should bear in mind before deciding on the best course of action. Ask yourself whether there are other options that are as effective but require less personal data. Where a data protection officer has been appointed, involve him or her at an early stage. Work closely with the competent works council. In this context, please also note that a Works Council agreement can provide a legal basis for the processing of personal data. More on that later. Prior to implementing any measures, a data protection impact assessment should be conducted. And finally, when in doubt, check with the local data protection authority about their opinion. And now I hand over to my colleague Pauline, who will talk about personal planning and development. Thank you, Svenja. Even after the end of the lockdown, for many companies, it may still be necessary to save on personal costs. Many German companies have already made use of short-time work. 
But even beyond short-time work, there are several options for saving personal costs in the medium and long term. For example, the deployment of external personnel can often be terminated at short notice and in a less complicated manner than the deployment of permanent staff. On the other hand, employment relationships can be terminated during the probationary period without having to comply with the strict requirements of the Dismissal Protection Act. Variable salary components, such as bonuses, can be reduced or discontinued in accordance with the options that are granted under the bonus agreement. So, can an employer unilaterally cut salaries in Germany? Thank you for this remark. I agree that salary cuts can also be a way to save costs in the medium and long term. The options available to an employer in this regard depend largely on the basis on which salaries are paid. Salaries that are paid on the basis of a collective tariff agreement can only be reduced with the agreement of the union. Typically, unions will demand compensation for such a salary adjustments in form of a general prohibition of dismissal. If, on the other hand, salaries are paid solely on the basis of an employment agreement, the consent of the employee to re reduction in salary is required. Only in very rare cases can salaries be reduced without the consent by way of a so-called constructive dismissal. With this type of dismissal, the employer terminates the current employment agreement and offers to continue the agreement with a lower salary. The requirements for the legal validity of such termination for change are exceptionally high. German employment courts generally require that each individual termination for change of salary will be based on a comprehensive restructuring plan for the employer's business and or that the salary reduction will be inevitable to avoid an insolvency situation of the employer. Another option is to discontinue voluntary benefits. These include monetary benefits such as meal allowances, anniversary payments, relocation allowances, etc., or benefits in kind such as free drinks, childcare, free parking, or company parties. It should be carefully examined whether the benefit in scope is actually a voluntary benefit or not. For example, if the claim has arisen over the years from the so called company practice, this may not be the case. Ultimately, significant savings potentials can also be realized in occupational pension schemes in certain cases, taking into account the case law of the Federal Labor Court. If dismissals can no longer be avoided, it is necessary to examine what effect a recently introduced short-time work has on mass dismissals. If employees who receive a short-time allowance are now to be terminated, the Federal Employment Agency will no longer grant short-time work benefits, with the result that the normal salary must be paid during the notice period. In many cases, Works Council agreements on short-time work that have been concluded with the Works Council in the past also provide for a general prohibition of dismissals, so that dismissals are off the table as an option for a certain period of time. So what can I do as an employer to stay flexible with my future personal planning? With regard to future personal planning, many companies are currently still cautious and want to remain as flexible as possible in order to avoid long-term cost commitments. An employer can, for example, work with fixed-term contracts or use external personnel through employee leasing agreements or at least where this is legally possible, outsource activities through contracts for works and services. And with that, I hand over to Svenja, who will inform us how the Works Council needs to be involved. Thank you, Pauline. Let us now have a look at the third key player in many employment relationships, the Works Council. As many of you will surely know from daily work, 
The Work Council's rights in matters such as hiring of staff, termination of employment, and working conditions are far-reaching. As a consequence, we have already heard various mentions of the Works Council and its involvement in measures and matters surrounding the return to work. There are three aspects we would like to further elaborate on in this regard. Works Council co-determination in personal and social matters. Works Council co-determination as a legal basis for data processing and Works Council co-determination in the context of changes of operation, operations and or termination. A few examples for co-determination in social matters. The Works Council has a co-determination right concerning all matters relating to the rules of operation of the site and the conduct of employees at the site. Other co-determination rights concern arrangements for the protection of health, the establishment of general principles for vacation arrangements, or the commencement and termination of the daily working hours and the distribution of working hours among the days of the week. That sounds very broad. Does that mean I have to involve the Works Council in every decision I take? In short, yes. Most aspects we have heard about today are indeed subject to the Works Council's co-determination. A short summary of measures considered or taken by our clients within the last few weeks that required an agreement with the respective Works Council includes rules and regulations concerning the behavior at the office, such as face mask requirements, limitations to the use of conference room and other office spaces, or other measures intended to ensure that employees keep the necessary distance. Also, regulations based on which employees are required to use a portion of their vacation entitlements during the summer months, and changes to working hours and shift work, including staggered breaks for different departments. Finally, working from home arrangements, in particular with respect to the usage of technical equipment such as laptops and mobile phones. Please also note that long-term working from home arrangements can even constitute a transfer requiring the Works Council's explicit consent. This is indeed very broad, but on the other hand, Works Council agreements are mandatory for the employees. Therefore, employees are bound by the rules and regulations let down in Works Council agreements, and employers do not need to seek the individual employee's consent. Works Council agreements have other advantages as well. In particular, they can serve as a legal basis for data processing, including the processing of health data. And what can I do if the Works Council does not agree to my plan? In most cases, unfortunately, it will not be possible to unilaterally implant any measures. Instead, if no agreement with the Works Council can be found, employees will need to appeal to the Competent Employment Court or to the so-called Reconciliatory Committee, who will then take a binding decision after hearing both Works Council and employer. Both of these processes are not only lengthy, but can also become rather expensive for employers. Therefore, it is recommendable to involve the Works Council in all decisions from the early stages of planning and, where possible, to maintain an amicable relationship with the Works Council. So what happens if I need to let people go or if I decide to make any changes to my operations? The Works Council's co-determination rights in the context of changes of operations and or terminations continue to apply unchanged. Therefore, the Works Council still needs to be consulted before an employer can unilaterally terminate an employment relationship. In cases of changes of operations, such as a permanent plant closure, cutbacks, etc., the employer must also still discuss and negotiate with the Works Council in an attempt to conclude a so-called reconciliation of interests. In most cases, a social plan will also be required. In this context, Please note that West Councils often request restrictions to terminations for operational reasons in exchange for their consent to short-time work. These can range from increased co-determination rights to a complete prohibition of any termination. Before planning any such measures, it should therefore be verified whether additional requirements need to be complied with. And now I hand over to my colleague Vanessa, who will tell us about employee mobility in times of COVID-19. Thank you, Svenja. Last topic for today is employee mobility, and I will talk about business trips, travel restrictions, and issues regarding employees' residence permits and visas. 
When coming back to the office, it is advisable to keep business travel at a minimum. According to the official recommendations of the federal ministry, business trips and generally face-to-face -face meetings should be reduced to the absolute minimum and technical alternatives like telephone or video conferencing should be used where possible. Especially employees who are at high risk because of their age or diseases or live together in a household with a person who is at high risk should not be sent on business trips. If you as an employer decide to send employees on business trips to other countries, travel restrictions should be monitored closely. You'll have to monitor if employees are actually allowed to enter the respective country. You should also monitor if they are subject to quarantine measures once they enter the country. If employees have to self-quarantine for two weeks after entering the country as a business trip may not be useful. Should furthermore be monitored if employees are subject to quarantine when they come back home to Germany after the business trip. Currently, when entering Germany from areas of high risk, a two-week quarantine is mandatory. High-risk areas can, of course, change on a daily basis. The list of high-risk areas is currently very long, and, for example, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, and also parts of the USA are considered high-risk areas for the German authorities. It's furthermore important to know that the regulations on quarantine obligations are issued by the relevant federal states of Germany in their own responsibility. That means the regulations can therefore be different throughout Germany. You may not only have employees on business trips, but also foreign employees who are not able to travel back to their home country or travel back from their home country to Germany. Monitoring the status of employees' residence permits and visas is, of course, always important, but foreign employees may require more support during these times as traveling is still subject to limitations. The competent federal ministry has therefore published notes to the local authorities providing guidelines how to handle these very special situations caused by the corona pandemic. According to these guidelines, local authorities should allow foreigners to apply for extensions of residence permits in informal ways, for example, by phone or email. Applying for the extension will result in the residence permit applying until the decision of the local authority is made. This will be important for foreign employees who find themselves in a situation where their resident permit expires and they are not able to leave Germany as there are simply no flights to their home country. If an extension is not possible or not granted, and foreigners are not able to, tra to travel back to their home country as there are still no flights, local authorities should grant a suspension of deportation so that the foreigners can actually stay in Germany until transfer is available back to their home country. Where foreign employees actually travel to their home country, for example, for a vacation, and are not able to come back within the six months required due to lack of flights and are therefore risking the expiration of their residence permit, Generous extension of the six-month period should be granted by the authorities. Where you have foreigners visiting, for example, for a business trip, and they are not able to leave Germany due to a lack of transport, it is important to know that the competent federal ministry also issued a regulation according to which foreigners with an expiring Schengen visa will be exempt from the visa requirement until 30 June 2020. This regulation may be extended. Foreigners who are able to enter Germany for 90 days without a visa should contact the local authorities before the expiration of the 90 days period and can apply for legalization of the status until they are able to leave Germany. This is, of course, a brief overview only. We strongly recommend to contact the local authorities well in advance of the expiration of the residence permits or visas. Thank you, and I'll hand over back to Hagen. Thank you, Vanessa. This brings us to the end of this webinar. Thank you for joining. We hope you found it helpful and please do get in touch if you have any follow-up queries. As mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is part of our 1000 series focusing on the top 10 issues that employers need to consider in the next 100 days. You can access the other webinars in this series over the coming weeks covering Brazil, France, Hong Kong, UK employment, UK pensions, US employment, US benefits, and global mobility via the Mayor Brown Responding to COVID-19 portal, which is available through the Mayor Brown website or by searching covid19.mayorbrown.com. If you would like similar information on another jurisdiction, please let us know by reaching out to your usual Mayor Brown contact or emailing our events team at lon-events at mayorbrown.com. We work with a well-established network of law firms in a wide range of jurisdictions we'll be happy to explore a joint webinar if there is sufficient interest.
Thanks again for listening and we look forward to you joining our future webinars. Thank you for listening. We hope you found this useful. This series forms part of Mayor Brown's 10 Hundred series, providing guidance into the top 10 pivotal issues across various topics that businesses need to be mindful of in the first 100 days of returning to work. If you have any questions, please get in touch with any of the speakers or your usual contact at Mayor Brown, and we will be happy to follow up with you directly. For the latest COVID-19 related legal developments, please do visit our dedicated portal called Responding to COVID-19, which is available through the Mayor Brown website.